Awesome. So anyone listening on recording, um, you've only missed my boring introduction. Um, and I'm about to hand over to Megan to hear more about T-cell. So Megan, over to you. Hey, great. Thanks, Em. Um, and just seeing in the chat. Um, OK, so we've got people from Wimbledon, Portsmouth, Toronto as well. That's interesting. Um, I was wondering as well what people's background are um, of uh, genetics of T cells, immunology. Um, yeah, who am I talking to here? Um, so if you could put on the chat, that would be great. But in the meantime, I will share my screen. Um, why are you not working? Okay, so you can see this okay? Fantastic. Okay, so as Em introduced, I'm Megan. I'm a PhD student currently studying in the Trinker Lab at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. So um, Gosha Trinker Lab, uh, the lab um, focuses on T cell immunology, um, specifically using huge screening approaches to identify the genetics involved in immune mediated disease. So we're talking like diabetes, um, auto, other autoimmune conditions, lupus, um, IBD, all sorts, because we're a very big screening approach, we don't necessarily focus on one disease. Um, but I'm focusing, um, but yeah, so I'll go into it a bit more. So this was composed for the students, but I just wanted to have a bit of a revision of um, what cells um, of the immune system people know. Um, so hopefully when you um, ask people come up with ideas of, of like macrophages, uh, T cells, B cells, um, neutrophils, NK cells, um, to name but a few. Um, but I won't um, get you guys going to do, do that. But anyway, so there's a lot of different immune cells um, and they're all involved in disease. But I think T cells are particularly in interesting because they are the innate, uh, sorry, they are the adaptive portion of the immune system, um, which means that they are kind of your specific long term response. Um, and within the umbrella term of T cells, you've got all these different subtypes of T cells which have been polarized um, through various cytokines to exert specific functions. So for example, um, Th2, um, the Th2 response is typically, um, uh, so a hyperactive Th2 response can lead to allergies. Um, and um, T regs are your T regulatory cells. And so they simmer down the immune system. And so um, just as a bit of a basic summary as well, what differentiates the B cells from the T cells is the fact that um, the B cells mature in the bone marrow and they um, mostly exert their functions through antibodies. Whereas T cells, as I said, there's loads of different subtypes and actually that means that they have loads of different functions. Um, so I got the students to ask here, what out of um, these, que these questions at uh, sorry, these answers, which do T cells do? And of course, it's a bit of a trick question because they do proliferate, they migrate to the lymph nodes to recruit more immune cells, they kill infected cells as cytotoxic T cells, and they secrete cytokines. Um, so you can see why I'm interested in them. And they are in those in that broad category of killer versus helper. So um, killer T cells are specialized to exert those cytotoxic effects, whereas um, helper T cells are um, more involved in like recruiting other, teeth, uh, other cell types. Um, and if you want the specific molecular terminology here, um, the killer T cells are CD8 positive. So um, this is a cell marker on the cell surface, um, which um, I can use to differentiate the two. Um, and these are CD4 positive. Um, so, and yeah, they have lots of different functions, lots of things that can go wrong. Um, so just as a, a summary of where they sit within the diagram. So 
let's take a step back here. Um, what is a T cell? Um, it's a type of white blood cell um, of which, so of T cells, there's around 25 million to 1 billion in the human body. And that varies um, depending on your age, your sex, your um, amount of like, whether you're battling with an infection at the time, whether you've got an immune disease, um, is very variable and the different specificities also vary within an individual, but they are the key regulators of the immune system. And so because they're, um, care because they're key mediators, they're carefully controlled. In fact, they require three signals in order to become activated. So you may have heard of the T cell receptor. So this recognizes specific antigens that are presented by an antigen presenting cell, um, like a macrophage. And together with this first signal, you then require a co-stimulatory signal, um, which is from these ligands CD28 and CD80. Um, and then you have the polarizing signal. And this is what I was saying that you can have different subtypes which are pushed to those subtypes by communication from cytokines. And so you can have um, IL-17, which will push this T cell to a TH17 um, subtype. Um, so, and also as well, please do answer, ask any questions as I go along. Um, otherwise I'll just storm through. <laughs> Um, so I'm interested in what could possibly go wrong, and there is a lot. So this is just a, um, an, a, a figure from one of my uh, molecular biology textbooks, which I don't look at that regularly, to be honest, but there's loads of different genes here that could be if, if affected. And the amount of variation within the human population means that there probably are variants within these. And so you find that if there's a knockout, um, if there is a dysfunction in one of these genes, then you can have an impaired T cell response. Um, and I'm interested in one of these genes. So the IL2RG, um, this is the common subunit, the gamma subunit of the IL2 receptor. So the IL2 receptor, um, let's again, take a step back. IL2 is the key growth factor for um, T cells. So it requires, uh, they're required for growth and proliferation, and the receptor is composed of alpha, beta, and gamma. And why I'm interested in um, IL2RG is that when you get a knockout of that gene, you get a immunodeficiency. So an immunodeficiency is where you have a compromised immune system, and this is most well known as the boy in the bubble disorder. Um, this particular, um, this particular um, case of immunodeficiency. So it predominantly affects males, and this is because the gene is found on the X chromosome. And so for females, we have two copies of the X chromosome, and so if we have one dysfunctional gene, then the other will compensate. Um, but for boys, they only have um, one. And so if that's dysregulated, they're going to have an issue. Um, so David Vetter was born in the 1970s, I think. Um, and I'm sure you would have heard about him. Um, but he lived to the age of, I think, 14. Um, purely through um, living in a very um, safe, um, well, in a bubble, in order to protect himself for the environment that would normally um, be fought off by your immune response. Um, but because he was born with no um, functional T cells, then he, if he had an infection, would be unable to fight it, and the infection would take control. And unfortunately, that is actually how he ended. Um, he got a in, infection, sadly, from a transplantation from his sister. So they transferred some hemo hematopoietic stem cells. So the stem cells that generate um, your immune system. And um, they transferred them to him, but they didn't realize that she had a dormant virus. Um, and so 
her immune system kept it in check. Um, but in, um, in, the, uh, in an immunocompromised individual, it could just um, proliferate and he was, yeah, not great. But it makes it really interesting to study. And so what we find is that T cells are at a delicate balance between immunodeficiency and autoimmunity, where if we have um, um, defective T cells and um, then we get hyperactive, uh, sorry, hypoactive, so um, underactive immunity. And then you get um, on the other, uh, other spectrum, you have overactive or too, too much immunity. And so, as I mentioned, these are diseases such as multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis. Um, I also got the students to guess some other ones and they came up with some pretty good ones that I... Oh yeah, there was ones that I was like Googling behind the scenes because uh, like we'd heard of it, but I didn't, you know. No idea. Much, I thought it was really impressive. <laughs> I asked some other students as well. I was like, have you heard of this? And they were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's just been a, a, a question in the, in the chat box around the sort of um, X chromosome linking uh, type things. And John's asked if that's sort of disproportionate compared to other chromosomes. Um, what do you mean? Sorry. So, so he put there seems to be a lot of Im, uh, immune pathway proteins encoded on the X chromosome. Is that disproportionate compared to other chromosomes? Are there, are there more immune related proteins on the X chromosome compared to other chromosomes, or is it just, just that we know those ones better? I know that obviously, like uh, sex links diseases tend to be easier to spot, so it might be easier to study. But I didn't know if it was disproportionate or just better I, known. I, yeah, I don't know whether it's fair to say that there's a lot of immune pathway proteins on the X chromosome. If you're referring to the previous um, pathway diagram, they're not all on the X chromosome. Um, they are just um, encoded on various chromosomes. Um, but actually, it, it's a very interesting study of um, what genes have evolved to be on the X chromosome because there is evolution there and um, it's there's arguments that the IL2RG gene is actually on the X chromosome so that it compensates for dosage, gene dosage. So um, it's well known that females have a heightened immune response to males um, and they also have a higher incidence of autoimmunity um and um so with higher rates of like psoriasis etc lupus um and it's thought that maybe it could be due to like a, a bit of a um like they could have evolved to have a heightened immune response because oh i could get carried away on this um maybe i'll try and keep it brief but um there's there's more selective pressure for females to survive. That sounds awful, <laughs> but there is. And um, there's this thing called the grandmother effect, which um, there is an advantage to offspring to have for their grandmothers to survive because grandmothers would typically stay around and help raising the children. This is like in cavemen terms here, I'm all about equality and everything now. Um, but in cavemen terms, it was advantageous to have a grandmother. And so there's a selective pressure for that heightened immune response and that heightened ability to defend against um, infections, infectious um, diseases in females. And so there's an argument there that um, disease um, genes such as that have actually evolved to be on the X chromosome. But otherwise, you could argue that there would actually be a selective pressure against genes important um, for like a functional immune system to be on the X chromosome, because there's that risk that one dysfunctional copy will cause disease. Um, but I do think what M said that um, it's potentially more noticeable because um, you see these males born with an immunodeficiency. That's some great, Sorry, great that, answer. <laughs> that was a bit of a long-winded thing, but the grandmother effect is really interesting. I'd recommend having a read. Um, any other questions or am I okay to keep going? No, that, that's all good for now. Okay, great. Um, so um, I am 
so that's why I'm interested in T cells. And then, so how am I studying T cells? And I'm using this really cool technology called CRISPR, which I'm sure if you ever have a biology background, you would have heard of um, the so-called like gene editing scissors, um, the ability to edit the DNA. Um, and this I can use in order to test all possible mutations um, within my gene of interest. And this is interesting um, oh, because it essentially allows me to test set, test possible mutations before they're observed in the clinic. And so I generate this um, increased um, diagnostic um, database um, and also helps with machine le learning algorithms and things to develop therapeutics. Um, so just as a recap what CRISPR is, um, it refers to the Cas9 enzyme. So the Cas9 enzyme is in blue and Cas9 is um, can be targeted to cut a specific region of DNA by um, use of a guide RNA. And then this is synthesized. So I could order a guide RNA uh, against a specific part of the genome um, that I wanted to cut, and it will target um, that area, um, that region, and then perform a double-stranded break which normally functions to um, knock out the gene. And so we have this really cool way of assessing gene function by knocking it out and seeing the effect. Um, maybe I should as well um, recap on what is the mutation. Um, a lot of the students did actually know what this was, which was good because it means that Cancer Research UK um, is doing a great job, um, but it is um, actually a, a natural phenom phenomenon where we have a change in our DNA sequence. So it can occur naturally, and we do have a, um, a, a mutation rate, which is, I can't remember the fat figure, but it is higher than you think. But the thing is that our, our, our cells will repair um, the damaged DNA, or they'll kill the cells that have got um, damaged DNA. And cancer results when you have that damage, but the cells overcome those death signals to say, die, you're corrupted. <laughs> um, and so it is natural, um, but it is exacerbated by the result of environmental factors such as UV, um, smoking, and also bacon, I have to say, um, you're at an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Um, so, um, so just as a um, summary as well of how a mutation comes to fruition is that um, your DNA is transcribed to RNA. Um, this is the central dogma of genetics. Um, and your RNA is then translated through ribosomes to produce a protein. And this is a sequence of amino acids, which is code coded by specific codons um, in the RNA. And that is then um, formed into um, a particular protein. And so mutations involve changes and they can involve point mutations where you can have a change from a T to a C, so a thymine to a cytosine or you can have a substitution um, where there's a bigger chunk. You can have an insertion, which are particularly, along with deletions, like damaging because they shift um, the codons. And so it doesn't just mean that that amino acid has changed, um, but all the following amino acids because they're successive. Um, and then you can also have things like inversion. Um, so that can result in no function, no protein being produced, um, a change in protein activity. Um, so more or less, um, or also in cases of a different protein. And actually there's a cool example of one protein. Um, so GFP is green fluorescent protein produced by uh, this, this jellyfish. <laughs> um, I can't remember the Latin name, but it's used a lot in genetics as it's a really good marker. So we can, um, we can clearly see green fluorescence, um, but one single amino acid, uh, one single substitution 
can cause it to change from GFP, so green fluorescent protein, to BFP, to blue fluorescent protein, um, which makes it really cool for studying um, as like a, a way of testing the efficiency of an edit. Um, and there is loads of more information um, available at your genome, um, which is really easy to understand um, and contains some cool figures. So <clears throat> this is a picture of our normal our chromosomes. So you've got your sister chromatids and you've got um, 46, 46 chromosomes um, and um, in total. And this is a technique where you use fluorescent probes to specifically um, label all the different chromosomes in, so in order to see gross um, changes in the chromosomes. And so this is the cell line that I'm working with. As you can see, it's very dysregulated. Um, so I got the um, students to play a bit of um, spot the difference. And you can see there's lots of issues um, from chromosomal, um, uh, like, uh, in, uh, increases in chromosome number to translocations here you can see a translocation between chromosome x and chromosome 13 um also like um some uh, like chromosome 7's got like five of them um but the point here is that can um there's mutations can be on a tiny scale or they can be on this gross abnormal or abnormal scale um, and these gross abnormal scales are typically associated with cancer because no normal cell will survive this. Um, it will be signaled to die um, by the immune system um, and various pathways involved. And so my project is looking at the IL2RG um, gene. And we know that there are certain variants observed in the clinic. So these are those where um, if you inherit them, you'll probably get an immunodeficiency. Um, and what I'm trying to do is use CRISPR to investigate all other possible mutations um, through this screening approach. Um, and whether or not these different variants can um, lead to immunodeficiency or autoimmunity. And this has been done in the BRCA1 gene, so the so-called Angelina Jolie gene or the breast cancer gene, where mutations increase your risk of breast cancer um, by, um, well, like 50 to 70% of women with mutations um, in it will develop breast cancer by 80. And so like Angelina Jolie, for example, knew that she inherited a mutation and so decided to have a double mastectomy in order to reduce her risk um, of actually developing um, breast cancer. Um, but what I hope to do is do similar with my gene in order to find those genes that are particularly, uh, those variants that are particularly um, associated with disease. Um, and then I spoke a bit more about um, my day as a scientist, because I think people don't really know what it go what goes on. Um, I don't sit around in a lab coat all day. I have today, but not always. Um, so in case people are interested, um, I guess um, my typical day would be checking on my cells. So like you feed your dog, I feed my cells um, with some really um, some media which contains all the nutrients that it requires. And then I typically enjoy a cup of tea, getting to grips on the literature, um, which is a never ending battle. Um, there's papers published all the time specifically in, uh, I mean, in immunology particularly, but then in genetics as well. And so when you're studying both, it's a, it's a double whammy. Um, and then we'd have a lab meeting. And so science is incredibly collaborative, which is what I really want to like um, stress to the students that it's not a, a case of like what Darwin did or um, all these other scientists that have been on a single track and done everything themselves. It's all about teamwork and it's all about communicating your science and making sure that um, knowledge is transferred between everybody. Um, 
and then I do some admin and then I will stay in for flow cytometry. And so flow cytometry, just in case anybody doesn't know, is the ability to detect specific cell markers on cells. So I mentioned previously CD8 and CD4 with cytotoxic T cells and helper T cells. And so in this case, I can use flow cytometry to um, tag those target genes, um, those target proteins. Um, so then the cells get specifically tagged and then the cells go through this machine um, and emit a, uh, so the lasers, it, um, so it shines lasers at it and then detects the forward, the forward scattering and the um, side scattering and the difference in um, emissions and excitations in order to say whether or not this cell could, um, expresses this particular protein. Um, so that's what I would do on a typical day. And then you'd get to um, a graph like this which says, okay, yes, your cells do express IL-2-RG. And if I'd provided a particular stimulus, maybe the intensity increased even further, which means that the, the cell surface um, expression would be even higher. Um, so then I'd do that analysis, write up the results, um, plan experiments for the next day, or for the next week, I should <laughs> plan a bit further in advance um, and then prepare for the next day, um, which I don't know whether or not people actually do think that is a typical day in science, but th there are some scientists that would be in the lab all day. Um, but I think as a PhD student, you, you are essentially in charge of your project. And so you have to be the project manager as well, which means the admin side is you as well. <laughs> um, someone compared, uh, like I, I know that I compared feeding your cells to like feeding a dog, but someone's put it as like a, tamigot a Tamagotchi but cooler. And that's definitely how I'm going <laughs> to think is, about yeah. it. Like you, as a kid, I used to, you know, feed my Tamagotchi, but you get to go to the lab and feed, uh, feed cells. <laughs> yep, definitely. <laughs> um, so that is why T cells are cool and why I'm particularly interested in them. And so I was wondering if there was any questions. Um, please don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Megan. So if anyone does have questions, you can either put up your um, physical hand or digital hand or pop them in the, the chat box and I'll um, read some of them out. Um, I think the, the students were particularly interested in the flow cytometry. I think a lot of them hadn't heard about it. So um, I remember what this the students that sort of was a quite a decent sort of point we went we went over so um i'll give it a minute for people to put questions in the chat box sorry i feel like that was a bit of a whistle stop at all but <laughs> uh john's asked what's the pathway that drives perforins perforins um uh so perforins perforins are uh, when you make holes in bacterial cells right Admittedly, this is not, <laughs> I haven't studied this since probably first year university. It's just um, a spot test for you now. <laughs> no, this is hard. Um, I think it's the, the death pathways. I'm not sure. To be fair, somebody who said that they did a PhD in microbiology might be better suited to answering that. Uh, yeah, Andrea said killer T cells produce it to destroy infected or damage uh, says self, but I wonder if that was meant to be cells. Um, can't remember the molecular pathway though. Mm. That's fair enough. It doesn't. doesn't... Yeah. I think the issue though with perforins is that, um, so that's a very inflammatory pathway to get rid of um, damaged cells because it essentially leaks the cellular contents out, um, which means that all your potentially infectious, um, um, infectious uh, material is spreading. And so what um, cells prefer to do is apoptosis, which is a slow controlled cell death, um, where there's kind of like clean um, degradation of all the um, damaging stuff. Um, but yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so, that's very interesting. Allergy versus parasite dichotomy. Yeah, because there is a um, hypothesis that, so it, it, it ties in with the hygiene hypothesis that you, this a huge increase in the amount of allergies that we have um, in our um, in our modern day lifestyle is actually a result of um, lack of exposure to um, like microbes and um, parasites, um, helminths um, during our like early years, which we were previously exposed to when we were in a as a caveman. Um, so yeah, there is like an, a, a theory that because of that, the immune system is hyper-inflammatory because it kind of doesn't have anything to kind of focus on. Um, I'm saying this in like simple terms because I don't really um, <laughs> know the complete um, picture. Um, but yeah, I think they also did some studies where they actually introduced helminths into mice and they showed that the inflammatory response actually went down. Um, which kind of fits with the idea that we're quite mutualistic. We're, we have evolved to have these parasites and this micro, microbiome. Um, but yeah. Uh, no, that was really, that's really interesting. Um, so thank you for sharing about your day. So that, yeah, that's really nice. Um, and then in your project, um, yeah, anything that sort of really stumped you, like that you had one di one idea going on, or you moving in one direction, and the research sort of pushed you the other way. I know that you're sort of still in your in your first year, but any and yeah, I guess any sort of big sort of blockers in your work so far. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's the easy answer. Um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of cool things to investigate in science, and I think sometimes projects can get written with those cool ideas. And until you really are like a few months in and realizing how difficult they are, that people start considering, oh, maybe this isn't doable in a PhD. Maybe we actually need three PhD students. Um, so I had similar um, where my project was incredibly high risk. And um, basically it, it, it was ch changing a lot in the field. And because of that, it was, a lot of work to do and so we decided to take a bit of an executive decision that even though it would be really cool it is a, something that would be required for like a postdoc um and probably three of them as well um so yeah it, that, that's a case of like it wasn't necessarily the science but it was more um the reality of doing these experiments um but there's also been cases where you're really going down one way. So I was interested in another gene at one point as well. Um, but then you knock out the gene and you see that there's no effect. And then you're like, oh, okay. So I'll go to the other one instead. Um, so yeah, I think the ability to, to, to change um, and be flexible is a huge part of science and being res resilient is fundamental to a PhD. I think specifically as well within sort of genomics, um, it's the sort of the, the the pace change in the technology that really can dictate the scale of what you can do. So um, the amount of people on campus that I speak to that maybe only finished their PhD five or so years ago and say that actually what they did as a PhD would now be like an undergrad project because the technology's moved that far along that actually it gets quicker and easier. So I guess also just being able to like that yeah, this the scale changing so much that you don't actually know, you know, by the time you finish your PhD, the tech might have moved on so far that actually what what you've just described as being three postdocs work might become a PhD project again because of the technology sort of changing around it. So I think that's the other bit that I don't know strikes me, especially in genomics being mm -hmm. like a huge factor, just like where is the tech and how long does stuff take at the moment? No, absolutely. I, I think and it's scary to think that the students that you guys are teaching now will probably be doing the stuff that I do in a year, in a month. Um, like I, I spoke to a, a friend's mum who did a PhD back in like, uh, it would have been like the 1980s. And her PhD was largely doing PCRs, um, which like it, it's so simple to do, but she manually changed 
So PCRs is when you, you amplify the DNA and it goes through successive rounds of like hot, cold, hot, cold, so that you can denature the DNA and reform it. Um, and of course, it's been automated now in a machine that you whack in overnight and then you come in in the morning and there's loads of DNA. But she manually <laughs> went from hot to cold, hot to cold, hot to cold. And that was largely her PhD, which is just crazy. Um, um, we've got two questions from John. So first, what came first evolutionarily, humoral or uh, cell mediated immunity? Uh, so humoral... Mm, I don't know. Feels a bit chicken, it feels a bit chicken, <laughs> and, egg, chicken would, and egg, doesn't it? <laughs> I, would, I would hypothesize that it would be humoral because the antibody system is more similar to um, kind of like bacterial defenses and like the secretion of particular proteins, I'd say is more reminiscent of that. Oh, um, sorry, that's my thing. But um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to have to Google that. Um, and is the three-dimensional genome getting more attention in pathology now? That's a huge area at the moment. Um, so the way that the human that the the genome folds and interacts with each other. So it's called chromatin um, accessibility. So chromatin is the way that the gene the the genome is kind of packaged but it's not just whether or not it's open and therefore the bases are exposed and able to be transcribed it's whether certain parts of a certain chromosome is interacting with a part of another chromosome or um whether the, yeah so whether there's trans effects um and so there's this really cool mapping strategy to um identify which parts of the genome interact with each other um, because it's not it's not linear at all um, and so they can generate these like 3d maps um, I think it's there's a there's a um, interactive or there was at least a few months ago a interactive plotter called um, C H I C P chickpea maybe um, and it, it, it can show that one gene interacts with another gene, which is on a completely different chromosome more. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, could you explain the biochemical reasoning? How are we on time as well? Okay. Absolutely fine, yeah. Um, the biochemical reasoning behind the activation of dormant immune, autoimmune disease such as lupus. Um, yeah, so I guess you're kind of referring to the fact that a lot of autoimmune disease is characterized by relapse and remission. So you can have um, autoimmune disease, um, but then you can go through good bouts where um, therapies isn't necessarily required and you can function fairly normally. Um, and then you can have like um, a relapse where um, all your symptoms flare up and there's various reasons behind that. Um, like in terms of day-to-day -day living, it could be due to like stress or environmental exposures. Um, but on an immunological level and a biochemical level, it is um, probably due to the fact that like your, your immune system gets hyperactivated. Um, and so there's some examples that like how that activation actually comes about is um, like, in like yet to be discovered it's not completely identified um but you can so for example ms uh, multiple sclerosis has been hugely associated to epstein Barr virus because they found that um a huge percentage of MS patients have been previously infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Now, before you like think that's a um, straight like diagnosis, actually Epstein-Barr virus, a lot of people have also been infected. Um, I think it's something like 70% of the population. It's, it's, it's a crazy amount. Um, but the fact that 100% of MS patients have been um have been infected previously suggests that they those patients have a genetic predisposition to 
autoimmunity to MS, that the Epstein-Barr virus, that antigenic exposure has then caused that um, disease to manifest. And so there's some um, various hypotheses about this, the fact that the um, antigen, like antigens on the EBV, um, EBV virus could be very similar to those of the myelin sheath, which is what the um, what there's immune attack against in MS. So saying that there's similar antigens there um, that can be attacked. Um, and there's various other, like, so similar with allergy, they think that there's conditions of that. Or you could have a genetic predisposition, which is kind of um, primed for that hyperinflammatory response. Um, so as I said, like females and males a bit different, it, it, it's also um, evolutionally makes sense that some people are able to um, fight off infections better than others, because um, like if if there's a if there's a um, a pandemic going around, um, those people would actually be able to survive. So it makes sense to have that genetic variation. But if your environment, such as the one that we live in now, is um, like protected, then do you get that hyper-inflammatory response against your own tissues instead? So with the helminth kind of um, idea as well. Um, it's very interesting. <laughs> um, uh, and, and a much easier one from John now, uh, just asking, are T cells easy to culture? So, <laughs> um, T cells are, once you know how to, yeah. Um, I think our lab is really good at it because we work on T cells, um, but that means that other labs come to us asking for help because in terms of other cell types, they're difficult. Um, so like epithelial cells, for example, super easy to culture. Um, and T cells are a bit more unhappy, um, but we have ways of making them live. <laughs> Um, this is an interesting question of how linked um, immune and neurological problems are. So there's loads of interest in this area. Um, there's a really good book um, called like The Inflamed Brain or The Inflamed Mind or something by, I want to say El Bul Ed Bulmore. Um, he, he basically draws the link between people that have autoimmune disease also suffer from various mental health disorders, including depression. Um, and so he argues that actually um, depression and other um, conditions of the brain are actually a manifestation of this autoimmunity, but in the brain instead. And then there's all sorts of questions of how is that, how does that come into uh, like how does that come about um, because you have like the blood, blood brain barrier um, and there's loads of studies going into this at the moment which is super interesting I'd be very interested to do a postdoc in that kind of area um, there's definitely also been a lot of that around sort of you said like the microbiome so um, for, for Mary who asked that question but also for anyone else um, I will attempt to uh, put a link to a, a talk we had Oh, that's the wrong one. I'll find the link in a second um, on the um, human microbiome, because we sort of talked a bit more um, with Hilary Brown from campus around um, that. There's been like suddenly a lot of interest in the microbiome. And he sort of went into which bits he thinks is like good bits of science and which bits are kind of been like potentially overhyped or like sort of overstated. So I'll find the link and stick that in there in a second. Um, they're probably better to ask than me. <laughs> um, how can your environment have an impact on the immune system? A lot. Um, I mean, I think when genetics became really popular, people started thinking that like it's kind of written, you can't influence your health so much because it's, it's written in your gen genetic code. But actually environment is so very, um, important and you see that in twin studies so as an example of this case is um, when you compare identical twins and their um, incidence of disease so it's really interesting when twins um, have 
um, both have the disease um, because you it, that suggests that there's a genetic um, a, a underlying genetic reason, um, or you could have a, a disconcordant. So you have one twin with a, a disease and the other without. So they have exactly the same DNA, but how how come one has disease rather than the other? And this is the case even for like very genetically um, associated diseases, um, such as like cancer and autoimmunity. But like your environment is still so very important. Um, and like, yeah, I think the my microbiome is very interesting because, because of that fact, the, the concept that you could essentially influence the amount your disease risk by your diet. Um, I mean, we have all this, this notion of like eat well, five a day kind of thing. But if we could identify particular species of bacteria within our gut, which confer an, um, an advantage, uh, like protection against a disease, that's, that's a fantastic um, revelation. Um, and whether or not it could be used um, to target certain diseases is interesting. Um. Uh, another one from John on uh, mitochondria and other organelles, whether they have a role in the inflammatory response. Um, let me have a think. I'm not entirely sure. I think if if I think about it, I think they definitely would um, because powerhouses of the cell and um they're so fundamental to the metabolism of the cell and like inflammatory t-cells have a very different metabolism to um regulatory t-cells or t-cells that are kind of um memory so they're not active at the moment um so i think i i don't know but i would suspect yes they would um and yeah, that's, that is interesting. Mitochondria is such a like uh, weird, I don't know. I feel like they add that whole like, extra dimension to a cell, but because they've got their own little genome going on and they're like obviously so fundamental yeah. that it's like, you've got the grips of the cell and now you've got this caveat of, you know, mitochondria that could sort of come in and change everything, you know, like mitochondrial diseases, you could have a completely healthy main cell genome, but if mitochondria aren't working, then that's, then there's no point so um yeah it's really really interesting um so a question on antibiotic resistance which might be sort of uh outside your sort of area but um do you see bacteriophages as a solution for antibiotic resistance in the future uh that is quite out my area <laughs> um but I, yeah it is quite i i can just remember from like um like uni, uni lectures um, that bacteriophages are a potential option. And yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I think the thing with antibiotic resistance is that there's not going to be another antibiotic that will eradicate all this resistance. You're going to have to need completely different creative strategies um, rather than relying on um like substances that have been produced by other organisms such as like penicillin um yeah oh yeah mitochondria i think so too like bcl comes to mind i, I don't know and fast ligands but I can't sort of pulling pulling memories yeah. out of the <laughs> the thing with being a phd student is that you, you know a lot about one particular area <laughs> and the rest kind of gets forgotten <laughs> Bags, yeah, that rings a bell. <laughs> oh um, well, those are some amazing questions, and Megan, thank you so much for um, attempting to answer um, so many of them because, yeah, I definitely couldn't have even made a start on them. So, um, if anyone's got further questions for Megan, um, I'll collect them via email or just in the chat box, and I can ping them to you later. But, um, Megan, I'll give you the rest of your evening back. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us, um, and then everyone else, we will sort of do a bit of a discussion on um, sort of this sort of series. Um, but, Megan, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Um, awesome. So, um, what I wanted to do is just for this sort of last section, and um, this shouldn't take 
the, the whole rest of the session, if I can at least find my slides, which would be a great start. Um, I know a lot of you have joined us for quite a few of these sessions across this academic year, um, and this is the last one uh, for the academic year. Um, and sort of, you know, whilst we go into to sort of summer and sort of planning out stuff for next year, um, we want to just sort of collect your ideas on how you found this series, any changes that you'd like to see, etc. Um, so you may or may not know that um, we run this in conjunction with Genomics Light, which is our student focused session. So our speakers like Megan two weeks ago gave a uh, basically the same talk to students and then return to give it to teachers. Um, so we sort of firstly want to know whether you found it useful to have the separate live sessions just for sort of uh, teachers and educators rather than joining the main genomics light sessions um, just to sort of make sure that that's a, a model that's working. Um, but then also more widely, um, our website, your genome is at some point in the next soonish time period, um, I want to say within the next sort of year, is going to get quite a major sort of um, refresh and update. So whether there's changes, um, I know a lot of you um, use your genome quite a lot, so whether there's any changes you'd like to see on your genome in terms of the functionality, in terms of, I don't know, layout, um, but also in terms of resources and, and all of that sort of stuff, um, what you'd like to see. So um, feel free to put comments in the chat box. If you need to run, no problem. I will be sending out a little feedback survey in the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, this is basically your time to tell us how you found things, what we can do differently and what changes you'd like to see on your genome. Um, Cause essentially we wanna make sure it's working for teachers. Otherwise um, we're just doing it for fun. Awesome, great to hear, John. And so I, I'm guessing by that, that you found it more beneficial to have like these a sort of um, these sessions compared to just joining the student ones. I know that it, yeah, I know that it does mean that we get to like a lot of the questions, I think this evening especially, are sort of a bit too high level or a bit too um, exploratory off topic, I guess, to, to, to do with sort of um, students as well. So good to know that um, that is useful. Awesome. That's great to know, Eleanor, that the um, the learning act, sort of sharing ideas for learning activities has been um, useful for you as well. Awesome. Thanks, Mary. Great. Well, it's good to know that um, on the whole, it seems to be that um, these sessions are sort of working so we can sort of take that into account for uh, our planning for the next academic year. Um, I'll be sending out a survey via Eventbrite, but also if you're part of our bioscience community, it'll be on the bioscience mailing list and on its learning, so um, you won't miss it. Um, so in terms of face-to-face -face and virtual, this programme will likely stay virtual just because I know that a lot of people that join us aren't local. Uh, John, I know, is on um, the Isle of Jersey, so um, as much as I'm sure he'd love to fly up to us every um, every month, um, it's obviously not super practical. We are exploring other options to do face-to-face, um, -face, um, essentially where we can do things like um, a talk. It's sort of easier for, for everyone for it to be online. For speakers like Megan, it means that she can just pop out of the lab for an hour and, and do a talk. We are doing some on-site days sort of in the next couple of months. And um, I know we're planning some for next year as well that are a bit more sort of lab focus, a bit more technique focus. And essentially we're trying to find that sort of best of both worlds that if it's a talk, then online kind of seems to suit everyone the best. But actually um, when we're going to bring people together, um, we want to make it as sort of beneficial for that to be as in person as possible. So, um, you know, whether that be that we can access a lab for the day, do sort of lab sort of skills. So that's um, the sort of direction um, that, that we're going down that way. Um, and John, in terms of the ones upcoming, I think those are ones that we've sort of been asked by, um, I think we're doing one with STEM learning. Um, I think they've been, I've seen them being advertised um, through STEM learning. Um, so uh, I can find you information on that, but I think it's a STEM learning event. Um, and then ones sort of in the coming year um, that are sort of more publicly 
yeah publicly bookable um we'll use all of our sort of usual channels so our newsletters um twitter all of that sort of stuff to let people know um when those are coming up awesome so yeah yeah i think from sort of discussions we've had with sort of this group and and from um other teachers and educators there does there does seem to be that you know for for a talk it is really useful that you can jump in for half an hour if you've only got half an hour whereas obviously if we're in person people don't want that people either come for all of it or none of it you can't sort of do that half and half so um that's really good to know as well awesome um i for anyone that doesn't already have it i will stick um i'll put my uh, I'll put my direct email in the chat box and to type and talk um so if you've got and i'll send out surveys and stuff if you've got any sort of specific thoughts or feelings uh, coming off the back of those feel free to pop them um straight to me if you just put sort of bioscience like in the header so i don't not entirely surprised by the email um then we can sort of take that all into account when we plan uh, sort of content for um next year so yeah that was all i sort of wanted to go through um sort of um afterwards we don't actually have many immunology related um activities the learning pack um on our genomics light page um has mainly got sort of videos and and activities from other um organizers it's not not one that we've got masses on at the moment um so yeah thank you for for joining us this evening we can wrap up a little bit early and enjoy the the rest of the evening um sun and yeah i'll be super grateful for any surveys that we can get filled in um and if anything else comes to mind pop me an email and yeah we'll can take it from there but um thanks very much for joining and hopefully have a good rest of the summer term have a nice restful summer break when it comes um if i don't see any of you before um and hopefully see you uh, again next academic year Thanks, everyone. Yes, Mary, so um, if you signed up via Eventbrite, um, then you'll get sent uh, an email via Eventbrite probably on Friday, if not next Monday, because I have to sort of get the video jimmy around a bit. Um, but it will be up by next week. If you miss it, because I know that Eventbrite emails can go to spam, if you don't see it by the end of next week, uh, ping me an email to that address and I'll make sure that you get uh, get hold of it. But yeah, there'll definitely be a video at some point in the next week. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.